video conference, like I said, and is being recorded. <laughs> to reduce background noise, all video conference participants will be joining the meeting in listen-only mode and will be muted during the discussion. WIDA welcomes comments from the public. A public comment period will be set aside after each discussion period and will be accepted in person and by video conference. Video conference <laughs> participants wishing to speak are requested to please email your name and item number you'd like to comment on to board of directors at watertransit.org. If you're unable to send an email, uh, you will be given an opportunity to uh, speak on the item after those who have uh, signed up. Uh, so welcome. Thank you all uh, board members for uh, providing a solid quorum here in the summertime uh, during a, uh, a uh, extensive heat wave. And I hope the heat wave is Enjoy. bringing more people onto the ferry. Certainly seems like uh, I've been riding quite a bit lately and it continues to seem like we're getting great passenger counts. I find myself uh, way you know, on longer and longer lines. And that's, uh, that's exciting uh, to see. Um, my report is uh, limited. I'm excited about tomorrow morning's um, uh, christening of the uh, of the sea change vessel, long in coming, the first uh, hydrogen vessel uh, for passengers in the world. And uh, we're excited to, uh, you know, a lot of important people coming together uh, to celebrate what's the culmination of a tremendous amount of work by a tremendous group of people. So I hope uh, those of you who are here and listening uh, will be able to uh, join What's, you know, I think it's a really important, it's not just, uh, you know, for show, this is a really important moment in maritime history and the opportunity both for passenger vessels and for hydrogen vessels, be they passenger or other purposes, uh, you know, it's a big opportunity. And, you know, we're really the ones who've invested in uh, and, and all of those involved uh, in kicking it off. So I'll have more to say uh, about that tomorrow, but uh, I, you know, urge you to, uh, Pay attention because it's not just a run of the mill event. I think it's a really important moment. And I'm very proud that uh, WIDA has been able to contribute to it. And I'm proud of Emily Loper at the Bay Area Council and our team has been, helped raise a lot of private money uh, that enabled us to be able to you know, provide a free service to the public. I think they're really going to appreciate. So, uh, with that, let me turn it over to our vice chair, of Monique Mark. Great, thank you very much. Welcome everybody, happy July, also my birthday month, if you're wondering. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I just wanna build on that. Uh, I'm just trying to remember how long ago it was when the Port of San Francisco staff and I first started working on hydrogen ferry vessels. Um, and it was probably at least over a decade ago, at least probably more like 15 years ago. So this for me is a really exciting moment um, and well, I learned a lot about hydrogen powered anything back in that time. It really, um, it really needed a sponsor, and it really needed uh, an entity that was courageous and able to think outside the box and really committed. And so, I'm going to be more proud that that is um, the combined forces of of Wida and Blue and Gold. So. So thank you, everybody, for being a part of that. I, I really want to commend um, all of our crew who have taken part uh, in learning how to how to manage this vessel. That you know, back when I first got started in this, there was a lot of suspicions and and um, concerns, and and uh, it's just so amazing to me to see how everything has evolved and, and moved forward. And so I'm super excited for tomorrow as well. Thank you, thank you all very much. And then uh, I'm actually really excited about today's agenda. There's some really great stuff on the agenda and looking forward to uh, moving some, some key items forward and hoping that makes way for another one of my pet projects from my port days, which is the Mission Bay Terminal. So it's hopeful to see that one on here someday soon, but looking forward to talking about Vallejo today. So, yay. Thank you. Director Alba. Um, I, I think you both have said it beautifully. I, I can't wait to get aboard and see residents from all over the Bay Area and possibly of the country and the world get on board and, and experience this um, hydrogen fuel therapy cell ferry. Um, and other than that, I'm very excited to, uh, to see the pilot of having um, 
service between Redwood City and a few Giants games starting up here in just a couple of weeks. Um, I am hoping to be on one of those ferries um, later this summer, early fall, um, since I live in Redwood City. Um, and I think it's an excellent pilot, both for our crew and um, vessel and just to see how to experience it and for writers to experience it from Silicon Valley. So looking forward to doing that. Thank you. I have Jeff. nothing to report. <laughs> Um, yeah, super excited about tomorrow and also just on the Redwood City uh, route, I am um, chair of the NorCal Presidents Alliance for the Association of Realtors all over the Bay Area, and I was sharing the, the Redwood City route with uh, the, the San Mateo Association president, and he was super excited to hear about that, so he'll be promoting that with his clients um, as well. And then I just wanted to share um, for the Juneteenth Festival in Vallejo, the ferry had a um, table and I can say that I just saw dozens of kids running over there to spin the wheel regularly and then running around with SFA ferry water bottles uh, or water, you know, uh, reusable cups. So that was super fun to watch. So appreciate the community involvement. Very, very good. And I guess we're all entitled to empanadas, right? Yeah. Here at, at, at Lamar, is that right? Yeah. So maybe we can hear a little bit uh, more about that when we hear uh, the report of staff. Yeah, great. Thank you, Director Chair Wonderman. Um, thanks for your comments about the sea change. Uh, really exciting week here. Uh, a lot of, as uh, Vice Chair Moyer said, a lot of exciting things on the agenda and, uh, and a great event planned for tomorrow. So I think it is coming together. It's really exciting to see the pilots start to take off after a long time planning this first one with our hydrogen vessel. We have the Redwood City service starting. We have the estuary service uh, starting and we have more um, that are being planned. So uh, that um, program uh, is really starting to emerge as something we can hang our hats on and accomplishing all of the goals that uh, we're hoping that they accomplish. We'll talk a little bit more about some of the goals and metrics and uh, more details specific to the estuary project in a bit. Um, I want to first, before uh, going into the reports of staff, introduce some new staff. Um, thanks again to the board for uh, approving um, and giving us uh, your trust in reorganizing the agency and expanding the staff capacity here. We haven't wasted any time uh, making some um, some changes among staff. A uh, couple uh, promotions to announce. Uh, Tim Hanners uh, is our director of project delivery. Um, so uh, congratulations to Tim. David. Now add some uh, additional staff uh, consistent with the reorg plan uh, to give uh, Tim's group more capacity to do some very important work. Uh, uh, Mike Gowardy is uh, our director of planning, uh, also promoted to director of planning. And uh, Chad Mason is our capital projects or capital planning manager uh, working under, under Mike. So we're making some room. Uh, congrats, Chad making some room in the uh, in, in the planning group to be able to add more capacity as well. And uh, part of the changes that have happened in Tim's group uh, include um, Jan, uh, being, Jan and Jeff both being promoted to uh, capital project managers, um, senior, senior project managers uh, within Tim's group. So uh, lots of uh, quick action uh, on the reorg plan. Uh, and then I want to introduce, uh, really happy to introduce Gary Griggs to the team. Uh, Gary is uh, our first chief capital program uh, officer. Uh, and Gary served that same role uh, at BTA most recently and was responsible for delivering uh, BART to Silicon Valley Phase 2. Uh, and before that uh, was at Parsons Brinkerhof uh, and uh, before they uh, the, uh, and, and was uh, president of Parsons Brinkerhof Infrastructure Company. And just looking at the laundry list of projects that he worked on in that capacity um, that are local, uh, it's really, you know, the, the who's who of Bay Area uh, infrastructure projects. The high speed rail project, uh, the BART to Warm Springs extension, the San Francisco Central Subway. Uh, he just has a tremendous track record. We're very lucky uh, to have Gary uh, as our first uh, chief uh, capital program officer overseeing um, the work that we're doing. Couldn't come at a more critical time. Uh, we have 
uh, RFPs for our uh, 400 passenger vessels, the, the electric uh, two two electric 400 passenger vessels that uh, were released last week. Uh, we expect this week the three uh, to release the RFPs for the 350 passenger electric vessels, and then very quickly after that, the RFPs for the universal charging floats. Uh, so uh, we're moving very quickly. There's a lot of shoreside infrastructure work that you're gonna hear more about. Um, now that Gary is on board, we expect to provide some regular capital program updates uh, to the board and he'll be the uh, name and the face that you see uh, associated with the, the program moving forward. Gary, I just wanted to invite you to say a, a few words to the board, if you wouldn't mind. Okay, Chair Lindemann, uh, Vice Chair Moyer, Directors, Executive Director Murphy. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak to you today, and in particular, thank you for the opportunity to be part of the team. Uh, uh, Director Murphy asked me to make a few comments. As you can tell, I've had a long and, and storied career, and so I promise to keep the comments very short. Uh, first of all, I, I'm really pleased to be part of the team. And I, I first of all, I want to acknowledge uh, all the entire staff, the WIDA staff, just how welcoming they've been to me and made me feel part of the team. Uh, tomorrow will be my third week uh, with the organization. And it's really gone very, very well. And in particular, I want to acknowledge uh, the talent and the, the success of the team in getting to where we are right now. So my goal is really to come in and support the team and continue to, to carry forward that type of success. Uh, I spent my entire career uh, basically planning, designing, and building public transportation systems uh, throughout the United States and globally, especially in the Asia Pacific region. And the reason I'm doing that is the reason we're doing what we're doing here is that wanted to address the congestion and mobility challenges that we have and especially in our dense urban centers, but in particular, also do something about the climate crisis. So I feel for, very fortunate to have spent my career in doing that and be very fortunate to be able to continue it here with WIDA as we continue to tackle those challenges. Most of my experience has been in the rail and transit arena, uh, in particular, uh, subway systems around the world. But I have to uh, remind you that those subway systems are electrified. So I have very extensive experience in electrification as well. In fact, one of the first jobs that I took when I came down from graduating from the University of Washington and started my career here in San Francisco was electrifying a thousand kilometer railroad in Africa. Oh. And then I went to Seoul, Korea, and did the same thing on the Seoul subway system. Mm. So and though I'm a civil engineer, I also have that electrification background that I hope will be a benefit uh, to the program as we're executing it here. Uh, my, although my project experience has been global, I consider my home to be the Bay Area in California. Uh, I raised my uh, kids here and I have family here and friends. I often say that I've spent most of my career trying to find a way to stay in the Bay Area because I've shipped, been shipped around the world. There's nothing better than being here and uh, Director Murphy mentioned some of the projects like Central Subway, like the BART extensions, and also high-speed rail that I've had the good fortune uh, to manage. Uh, but I have to say that while I take pride in the benefits, the environmental benefits and congestion mobility benefits of the projects I've done, especially in the rail transfer arena, I have to tell you that uh, electrified water transit has to be at the top of the list in terms of sustainable and environmentally sound approaches uh, to public transportation. So I have to tell you how pleased I am uh, to be able to be part of that. And one of the, I think, really benefits of water transit is we don't have the very high and intense uh, in interruptions of construction and the costs that are associated with other modes of transportation, of public transportation. So with that, I'll just uh, once again, uh, thank you all uh, for the opportunity to be part of the WIDA team. Thank you.
Thanks, Gary. Uh, and then we've had just a tremendously successful intern program here over the last few years uh, at San Francisco Bay Ferry. And uh, we have our newest intern, Linsa Himeskin, uh here. I want to introduce her. Uh, there she is over there. Um, and Linsa uh, has uh, most recently interned at MTC. Before that, she was a summer policy associate at Bay Area Council. So uh, she's been playing the greatest hits here uh, for a while. <laughs> Um, so only natural that she would come in and, uh, and intern for us at San Francisco Bay Ferry. We're looking forward to her learning a lot and us uh, giving her uh, some really good opportunities to help us out, too. You're moving up in the world. Let's <laughs> <laughs> uh, OK, then uh, I want to move, um, if we can, to a couple of items listed under the executive director's report. Uh, one is the regional transportation revenue measure, and uh, just uh, wanted to share the most recent updates on this. The board, um, I think, very uh, smartly endorsed the legislation that was moving through the, uh, the, the, the process in Sacramento. That's been paused, uh, and we've reported that to the board. But uh, MTC is, has taken the opportunity to sort of reset. Uh, and uh, talk with stakeholders about how to make sure that this process can move forward in a more successful way. Um, there's a limited time frame. There is you know, still time to address the fiscal, crisis, uh, fiscal cliff issues facing the Bay Area transit operators, but uh, just one more legislative session to be able to, to do that. So um, we have a transportation revenue measure select committee that's been appointed, and it includes commissioners, MTC commissioners that have been uh, really involved in the in the process so far, but also uh, organized labor representative, transit advocates. Uh, our chair Jim Wonderman is uh, is on the uh, the committee representing Bay Area Council. Um, so that's I think uh, very good news for us as well. And then there's a separate group called the Transportation Revenue Measure Executive Group, and that's where the region's transit operators um, are going to provide input, including the county transportation commissions. Uh, and I'm uh, representing the agency on that group. Um, our, our goal is still the same. Um, uh, I'll, I'll give uh, Chair Wonderman some time to uh, to talk here as well, because he'll probably have uh, some perspectives on this. But I think our agency's goal is the same, uh, to be able to maximize the opportunities for us to be able to expand, uh, for us to be able to uh, address our fiscal cliff, even though it's further off into the future compared to some of the other fare dependent transit agencies around the region. Uh, but we have uh, a lot of advocates that have stepped up the work that we've done uh, and Lauren Gillardi deserves a lot of credit for creating a really strong coalition of support from our advocates throughout the Bay Area, and they've been very vocal already in this process. So we're going to keep that up uh, and make sure that um, that any regional measure that goes to uh, the voters uh, will, in addition to helping agencies that have the most immediate needs, also help plan and fund the future uh, of ferry service around the region. Um, happy to answer any questions about that, uh, Chair Wonderman, and and, and also um, happy to turn it to you for any comments you have uh, about that process. Yeah, <clears throat> thank you. And you know, I think MTC was uh, quick to respond after the measure, uh, uh, Senator Weiner's measure, uh, didn't uh, you know stopped having um, any momentum, and there were a lot of con a lot of concerns expressed around the region that it wasn't really a regional measure. There was a unequal uh, distribution of funds. There were in e equity issues, a little East versus West. There's a little bit of everything in there. And so I think it was smart to kind of put a pause on it and then kind of call folks together uh, to see what can be what can be done here. From the perspective of agencies, especially from those, you know, especially from BART, which is expect you know expecting, uh, anticipating a very serious uh, fiscal cliff in a short period of time, and other agencies, you know, I think all of us have fiscal issues ahead of us. It's just a question of when and how severe. Um, we're all funded slightly differently, and uh, you know, so it's it's not the same for anybody. And there's so many agencies, but uh, you know that that serious BART fiscal cliff issue is very prevalent and uh, the agencies see it from that perspective. I think the public, which would have to vote for a measure like this, don't see it like that. They, they really see it from a service quality perspective 
what is it we have how can it be better um so you know if we, if 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 the only thing we can offer is you know pay more money and get the same thing you got i think the chances of achieving what is required there's a two-thirds vote of an ordinary public is very unlikely so we really have to work ahead of us to figure out what would entice the public uh, to support paying more money, you know, in an, what's been an inflationary period when people are sort of a bit at their wits end every time they go to the supermarket and, you know, things cost more. So, so, but, it, you know, we can't ignore this. We really have to work on it. We have to work on it uh, together. So that's the purpose of having this uh, group come together and figure out, you know, get really uh, wise about what it will take you know what 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 is it going to take to move us forward and make sure bay area mass transit goes forward not backward because that's the risk uh, that we face so i'm i'm pleased to be part of the committee um but it's it's going to be i think it's going to be hard work too and really interested in input from folks um you know uh, there's a lot of uh, expertise on the committee made up of people who are members of mtc but there's a lot of experts uh, in the expertise in the room, and we really need help at this point. I think think to how do we think through this and deliver something really better um, at at a time when it just moves us to do so. So welcome you to you know uh, join that process. Any uh, questions from the board on that one? Just hope. Yeah, no question. Just wanted to um, also mention that BART released its role in the region report, and I think it's a fantastic read um, about the the importance of our, of course, our regional transportation system and, and the region's 27 transit agencies, but especially BART's role. And it's had some really profound um, statements that I think the more of us who are aware of the implications of a true fiscal challenge, um, it, it's going to have devastating impacts on, on the entire region. So I, I think it's fantastic that we have the regional coordination that is going on. Uh, and we, all we can do is just continue working towards um, a measure for 2026. Good, thank you. Appreciate those uh, comments. Um, Moving, continue with the executive director's report. Um, we have our crew of the year um, uh, presentation. Raphael is going to uh, present that. The crew is not here, of course. I think they're in the field. <laughs> the crew of the year should be, but uh, we want to announce uh, those folks just the same. Perfect. Uh, so good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon, um, Director Murphy, board members. Happy birthday month. Oh, um, thank you. So, uh, <laughs> my name is, is Rafael Regan. I am the customer experience specialist here at WIDA San Francisco Bay Ferry. Um, and this year we um, is our second crew of the year here. Um, last year we started this program really with the aim to highlight um, our crew members that, um, that uh, employ uh, world-class customer service for our passengers as well as their colleagues. Um, so today I'd like to um, both uh, congratulate and announce these uh, these three winners. Um, so just for a little overview, the crew of your program aims at, aims at highlighting blue and gold customer-facing staff on San Francisco Bay Ferry services. This includes captains, deckhands, guest assistance representatives, passenger service center staff, and other staff who inter interface directly with our passengers. Staff are recognized by riders and their fellow peers via a nomination system and an online form. Once the nomination period has ended, a committee made up of SFA Ferry uh, staff, as well as Blue and Gold staff, review the nominations and pick winners based on the endorsement, the endorsements shared by uh, passengers. And this year we had more than 130 nominations from our passengers alone um, for our for our crew. So that was that was really great to see um, the program just become even more popular 
Um, I think last year we had maybe just over 100. So that was a really awesome thing to see. Um, and without further ado, so the first, um, let's see, the first crew of the year winner is uh, Luke Cabin. Luke Cabin is one of our crew of the year, uh, 2024 crew of the year winners. He's a deckhand um, based out of Central Bay. Uh, Luke Kevin has a dedicated, trustworthy, and hardworking is a is a dedicated, trustworthy, and hardworking deckhand. He is a true professional that you can count on. He ensures his passengers feel welcome, and he enjoys his uh, executes his job perfectly. So that was one of the uh, many commendations that he received from one of our passengers. Um, so congratulations to Luke. Um, and Luke has been with the agency uh, starting since May uh, 2019. Awesome. Um, next up is Gloria Freeman. Gloria Freeman is one of our captains. Um, she is a 2024 Crew of the Year uh, award. Um, Gloria on the 715 Vallejo to SF crew is a rock star. She is efficient and friendly. Thank you for keeping us safe. So that was one of the comments that we got um, uh, in regards to Gloria. Um, Gloria is also very kind and friendly and um, passengers always feel welcome on the ferry when, when they greet when they greet. Um, the, the passengers. Um, so congratulations to Gloria. And Gloria has been with us um, since 2014. And last but not least is Ron Garlitz. Um, Ron Garlitz is one of the 2024 Crew of the Year uh, winners. He is a deckhand based out of Central Bay. Uh, Mr. Garland is courteous, generous, professional, and very entertaining for ferry riders. He has expressed and shown how many people uh, how much pride and dedication he has for his career and the community that uh, we all serve. A man of honor and integrity deserves to be acknowledged as such. So this is a very nice commendation from one of our passengers. Um, so congratulations to Ron. And I just, before ending, I just wanted to kind of reiterate, um, while we do congratulate um, like three, three or four winners, we want to really uh, reiterate that um, we are so proud of all of our crew members. Uh, I want to remind you that we got more than 130 um, commendations, and so that goes for uh, crew all, of, all, all across the board. So uh, really, we want to congratulate all crew uh, this year, uh, specifically these, these three individuals. So thank you so much. Awesome. And with that, I will take any questions. Thank you for your time. Thanks, thank you. Rafael. Were they surprised, the winner? Um, they were surprised. Ron was pretty surprised. Yeah, was he? He was. I think he. When we presented, um, uh, Lexi and I, we we went to present uh, these awards at their staff meetings, and so I think Ron said, like, "Oh, I, I never would have imagined I would have uh, won something like this." So that was really always love to hear stuff like That's that. That's awesome. I love it. Thank you. I'm um, sorry. Another question, Ralph. Um, will we display these? these pictures on the vessels or anywhere where the passengers can see them? Absolutely. Yeah. So we'll um, we'll display, not only will we post on social media to let the passengers know of these winners, but um, we'll also have onboard graphics um, running system-wide so people can, um, can, can share and congratulate. Perfect. That's awesome. Great. Thank you, Rafael. Um, here, wonder when you have uh, financial statements in uh, the packet, uh, federal and state legislative updates. I will note the uh, federal legislative update. We're we're still waiting to hear the outcome of uh, hopefully what will be another successful congressionally directed uh, spending request for the Treasure Island ferry terminal. Um, also, uh, information in there, uh, Vice Chair Moyer, about your um, uh, your project in Mission Bay, uh, and hopefully we will uh, hear some some good news on that front when the. Clean Ports grant announcements are made, I think, in the fall. Um, and in the state legislative update, we've uh, had some good progress making uh, uh, our, our sponsor bill uh, from Assembly Member Wilson is making its way through the process successfully, and uh, hopefully it will be signed by the governor uh, before the end of the session, and that will allow our electric vessels that we'll be purchasing very shortly to not have state sales tax uh, applied to those vessels. They still will have local sales taxes, uh, Director Dew, uh, yeah. applied uh, to, yeah. uh, to those vessels. Yeah. Uh, with that, let me turn it over to Gabe and Joe for the operations and- um, Can I company. ask a quick question on the financials? Yeah. Um, I don't know if this might've gotten amended or not, but I noticed that for the year, 
it appeared, if I read it right, that for a bridge toll revenue, you know, we were about 80% of budget. So we're not pulling as much bridge tolls as we thought we would. So what's the, you know, what, what's the reason for that? Or is that, am I correct in reading it that way? So these financials are just from May, so we're not to the end of the year yet, okay. but they're, they, um, I have some data that you had asked about this last time, and I was going to send an email to all of you with some compiled data of the actual and the expected uh, RM2 uh, revenue is, is a little bit less than we had originally budgeted. So what that means, well, actually, if you look at all the revenue, you will see we had a little bit more federal revenue than we were anticipating because of the prior year. Yeah, now so, we've had from the prior year, right, rolled over to this year. So it's not a budget problem. We have enough revenue to cover the year. Um, and what will happen is we'll, if we need to, we we'll use RM3. But we have, we're closing under, we anticipate closing under budget. We'll know next month we'll have the June final report for you. But it, it is slightly lower than, than anticipated. And one of the answers that they gave me, and I'll, I'll put this in the information I sent you, is that... Um, as carpools is, have increased, even the bridge traffic has increased, um, yes. revenue hasn't increased as much. So it's in, it's an interesting little puzzle that trying to get to the bottom of why RM2 isn't rising faster. Okay. Yeah. So do, does it have, I won't, I, I won't drag this out, but does it have uh, too much? But does it have future implications for our ability to fund the operation? I think in the long run, we've always spoken about how there's always a fiscal cliff around the regional measure money that we get because it's capped at a certain amount and rev and expenses always rise in the long run. And so to the extent your revenue is capped, yeah, you, you, you will always have some long term. But this is something we've talked about that, you know, we now have a fiscal cliff that's much farther in the future because of our, our M3, thankfully, uh, but it's there in the long run. It's it, not an immediate problem. Yeah. Thank you. Other any other questions on that? Well, okay. Thanks. Good afternoon, Board of Directors. Gabriel Chan, Transportation Planner. Um, and to start, I'll hand it over to Joe, and he's going to cover the operations. Good afternoon, Directors. Uh, Joe Ramey, Operations Team. Just a quick update on system performance. Um, SFA's ferries on-time performance and service reliability continues to remain high over the first half of 2024. On-time performance for the period January through June was 97.5% system-wide, which is nearly identical to the same to the on-time performance uh, over the same period in 2023. On-time performance of uh, the Vallejo weekend service has declined somewhat in recent months. Uh, over the first three months of the year, January through March, on-time performance for the Vallejo weekend service was similar to the other routes, averaging around 97%. Uh, but since then, on-time performance for weekend Vallejo service has declined uh, somewhat in, in April to approximately 85%. Then it improved somewhat to 88% in May, only to decline to 78% in June. Uh, so the decline in on-time performance appears correlated uh, with higher ridership uh, experience since April, with ridership in the spring of 2024 exceeding pre-pandemic Vallejo weekend ridership. So really a surge in, in kind of weekend uh, Vallejo ridership driving that, some of this delay. Um, the operations team has initiated discussions with Blue and Gold to understand the underlying causes and to develop solutions to improve on-time performance of the, of the weekend Vallejo service. On the reliability side, uh, service reliability averaged 99.4% system-wide January through June of 2024, compared to 99.2% for the same period in 2023. Uh, there were a total of 152 trip segments canceled in January through June combined, compared to nearly 23,000 trip segments provided during this period. So canceled trips represent just 0.7% uh, of total scheduled trips during this period. And with that, I'll take any questions that you may have. Questions from the members of the board? All right. Um, so I'll cover the ridership component of the report. 
Um, so as you know, June, we kind of projected a very aggressive 254,000. Um, actuals came in about 3% under that. Um, but for the entire fiscal year, we closed out at about 105% of the projection that we had for fiscal year 24. So compared to 2019 pre-pandemic, the FY24 ridership was about 74% of what we had in 2019. Um, and the key drivers of our growth year over year, that's, um, we've really seen it come from the summer months and big kind of weekend, big event um, days in San Francisco, things like Pride, Fleet Week, um, other holidays as well. Um, and then not only the weekends are ticking up, we continue to see gradual increases for commuter uh, ridership during the week, um, pretty much on all of our routes except for South San Francisco. And then uh, the agency does continue to outperform the other regional operators in terms of regional ridership. Um, BART, I think, is sitting in the low 40s compared to their 2019, and then Caltrain is in the 30s while we're at 74. Do uh, you take any questions? Is there, is there something that happened in June that drove the numbers down? Was there a condition that resulted in that drop off? Um, not necessarily. Mm -hmm. We still, I mean, I think the main thing was that we were projecting a very big June just based on kind of the previous years and how much more June ridership we've seen over May um, in 23 and 22. And I think we pretty much hit the target. We were only 3% off, yeah. so it's nothing really to worry about. Um, and then moving forward, we have kind of a similar projection for 25. Um, could you remind us of what we're expecting the ridership growth to be over the next year? Over the next year, I believe we're projecting 7% growth over the 7%. actual spread. So not as aggressive as this past year? Yeah. Okay. Great, thank you. Great, thanks, Gabe. Um, uh, Chair Wonderman, that concludes the executive director's report. But I was going to ask on the on the state legislative update, which kind of went through the litany of cuts that happened to transportation. Um, you know, are there any impacts to us as a result of that? No I mean, impact. They pushed out a lot of money for the years unknown, really. Yeah, no, no impact on us, thankfully. Uh, we've been insulated from all of that. And the the freeze on the TIRCP funding was subsequent to this report lifted um by uh by by the, the state. So um so that is not affecting others either. Um those funds are going to be fully available in this next budget year. Um, but we we are not uh, beneficiaries of those TIRCP funds, and so we're not we're not affected by it. We wouldn't have been affected if they were frozen. Thank you. Okay. If there's nothing else, uh, any other questions? Thank you for the uh, report, and it's a upbeat report, and appreciate it. Uh, let's see, move on to the item number six, which is the uh, consent calendar. There are four items: A, B, C, and D. Um, do it, any members of the board wish to see an item uh, removed and heard separately? A any member of the public? So request. I'll make a motion with consent. We have a motion on the consent calendar. Second. And we have a second. Uh, call the roll, please. Chair Wonderman. Yes. Vice Chair Moyer. Yes. Director Alba. Yes. Director Del Bono. Yes. And Director Du. Yes. And I will note for the record that the consent calendar included this board uh, recognizing the uh, ferry crew of the year. So again, congratulations uh, to all to all of our workers. And you know, my my experience with the workers is I, I don't know how you're able to figure out which ones are actually the crew of the year, but it's a good exercise, and I'm sure they're extremely deserted. And uh, you know, would, I know they're always you know they're not here because they're working. And it would be nice to get all of the crew in one place at one time and honor all of our workers. And I don't know how we ever do it, but maybe if there's some way we could come close to it, uh, Pat, you know, we should think, think about it. Um, okay, item number seven, adopt mitigated negative declaration and mitigation monitoring 
and reporting program for the Vallejo Ferry Terminal Reconfiguration Project, the action item. Thank you, Chair Wonderman, Vice Chair Moyer, and Directors. Chad Mason, Capital Planning Manager. Uh, I'm going to give a general project update. Arthi is going to give an overview of the SQL process. We also have Alex Stuhl from Kimley Horn joining us on Zoom. Uh, Kimley Horn is our environmental consultant that is assisting with the environmental review of permitting. Today we have two, two action items for the Vallejo Ferry Terminal Reconfiguration Project. We're presenting them together. Um, they're both important actions uh, required to deliver this project. Uh, the first action is adopt a mitigated negative declaration and mitigation monitoring and reporting program. The second is approve the Vallejo Ferry Terminal Reconfiguration Project. They both need two separate motions um, for each action. So at the end of the week, when you approve. The goal of the project uh, is to reconfigure the ferry terminal such that uh, the frequency of maintenance dredging is greatly reduced or avoided. Um, thereby minimizing disruption to passengers, improving efficiency and overall operational safety of the ferry landings. Each dredging event currently is two to $3 million every two years. We do have a next event scheduled for 2025. Uh, the ISM and D considered a proposed project that utilizes the existing access point and two configuration options. The, op the options were studied to allow flexibility in case we encountered an issue with one of the options. Uh, all three options are cleared in the initial study. After today, we'll be moving forward with the preferred option to the proposed project. Scoping is not required for the initial study of mitigated negative declaration under CEQA. However, we've done it in the past uh, just to get input from stakeholders and uh, other interested parties. So in 2023, we undertook an extensive scoping project process to gain input from our riders, stakeholders, and our captains. Uh, and this included soliciting comments on the environmental review process, as well as getting input on which option was preferred. The scoping process helped identify the proposed project that was carried forward in the CEQA document uh, that utilizes the existing access point uh, where the ferry terminal operates out of today. Next, step, next steps include coordinating with the FTA for the NEPA clearance uh, and initiating the Environmental Resource Agency permitting process. Uh, later this year, we'll be starting on the design build bridging documents that will support the construction procurement in 2025, and we anticipate construction of the project in 2026. Hmm. I'll turn it over to Artie now for the sequel overview. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Chad. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Board of Directors, Artie Kukman and Ms. Kai. Um, so as Chad mentioned, I'll give an overview of the CEQA process and the environmental uh, analysis of this project. Um, so the initial study mitigated negative declaration, in short, ISMND, uh, was released in May for a 30-day public review period. And um, uh, during the uh, outreach process, uh, we received, uh, uh, during that process, we received about 200 letters. Uh, in accordance with uh, AB 52, we also notified the tribal groups about the project, and uh, we received a request for tribal consultation with one of the tribal groups, namely Yocha Dehe Indian Nation. Uh, this was our, uh, I think, our first ever uh, tribal consultation meeting for the agency. And uh, after the meeting, um, we received confirmation from them that. Uh, uh, we have addressed their comments and uh, that uh, we have uh, satisfied met the requirements of the in accordance with AB 52. Um, we also um, updated the project about the project to the city of Vallejo uh, in May as part of the June as part of uh, uh, their city council meeting. And uh, thanks to Director Yu, uh, who was there to offer support uh, for the project. Um, and uh, based on the um, ISMNT findings, the, uh, with the uh, mitigation measures implemented as part of the project, um, the environmental impacts identified in the study will be reduced to less than significant. Um, so today we are here to, as Chad mentioned, request a um, adoption of the final ISMNT. 
uh, we also prepared the uh, mitigated uh, uh, mitigation uh, reporting and uh, um, monitoring program, um, which is in short MMRP. Uh, that includes all the mitigation measures that will be incorporated in the project in order to reduce the impacts to the most significant. So I think I'll wrap up um, by requesting the board um, uh, for adopting the final ISM MMRP and also approving the proposed project. I can answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you. Questions from the from the board? Do you want to make a comment, Director Duke? Oh yeah, I just wanted to share this photo that I took this morning getting on the ferry to show how important um, it is to prioritize this project. As you can see, it looked like the vessel was about to uh, run aground. <laughs> and so, <laughs> and this is, you know, we're not gonna be dredging until next year, right? So if this is the situation now, I have a feeling that the tides are going to impact service in the year to come, so. Mm -hmm. The, the consultation that you had with the with the Native American tribe, what's the basis for that? It's a statutory uh, California AB Assembly Bill 52. Uh, it's relatively new. Uh, the best to think of it as a, a resource agency consultation. We have a long list of resource agencies that we must consult with. This is very similar process where, and it's the first time, as Arthur mentioned, we've had to do it. Uh, it it's a very important step um, to make sure that we do preserve the cultural resources that are at or near a site. And I could probably speak to why they had an interest in this particular project. So um, yesterday he went to Nation did have, or did have the land lease um, agreement for that blue building that's just to the left of the ferry terminal. Um, but they had this um, um, uh, ended that. So I don't know if the land lease has ended I think I saw Natalie Peterson on there, but so I don't know that they have an interest further, but um, that would have been why they were interested in it because it's adjacent to their, to the property that they were looking at developing. And it really came down to explaining the project in more detail, uh, especially the fact that we, we have very limited ground disturbance on the shore side. Uh, so our potential effect on, on buried resources uh, is really limited, if any. Okay. Thank you. I would expect it to have an impact on Mission Bay. An influence is probably better. Okay, other uh, any comments from members? Any members of the public uh, signed up, Melanie, to speak on item seven? Mm -hmm. Nobody has signed up. Yes, one. Oh, I'm sorry. We, we do. do. Oh, we have Marina signed up. Oh, yeah. Hi. Marina, you're uh, recognized. Oh, hi. Thank you. I'm in negotiations with Alcatraz Cruises, so forgive me for being uh, just a voice and not a picture. Um, good afternoon, Chair Wonderman and board members. My name is Marina Secatano, and I'm speaking today on behalf of the Inland Boatman's Union as Regional Director. I'm here today to voice my strong support for the Vallejo Ferry Terminal Reconfiguration Project. As you know, the San Francisco Bay Ferry provides an essential service between Vallejo and downtown San Francisco, carrying nearly 660,000 passengers in 2023. The success and reliability of the service are vital to our community. Currently, the Vallejo terminal faces significant challenges due to ongoing situations requiring maintenance dredging every two years. This process is not only costly, but also disruptive to both ferry operations and passenger experience. The reconfiguration project aims to address these issues by minimizing the frequency of dredging, thereby enhancing the efficiency and safety of ferry landings. The preferred con <laughs> configuration, which extends the terminal offshore while keeping the access point in its current location offers numerous benefits. It reduces the impact of San Francisco Bay Trail, optimizes passenger queuing locations, and ensures a more organized and efficient loading and unloading process. This design choice was informed <clears throat> by extensive feedback from Blue and Gold Fleet Ferry Captains and the public, as well as uh, reflecting a well-rounded and inclusive decision-making process. 
Importantly, the project complies with all necessary environmental regulations under CEQA and NEPA. The environmental analysis shows a preferred configuration, although larger in footprint, does not result in any substantially different or severe impact compared to other options. Furthermore, the project is fiscally responsible with funding for the design and permitting already included in the fiscal 2024-25 capital budget. The remaining budget estimated at 15.6 million will be covered by a combination of federal fund sources and RM1 bridge tolls. The Vallejo Ferry Terminal Reconfiguration Project is a crucial investment in our community's transportation infrastructure. It promises to enhance ferry service reliability and improve passenger experience and ensure the long-term sustainability of this vital transit route. I urge you all to support this project and help us move forward towards a more efficient and passenger-friendly ferry service. Thank you for your time and consideration. Thank, thank you for the current, for the thorough uh, comment, Marina. Um, other members of the public wish to speak on item seven? Hearing and seeing none, I will take a motion on seven. I would like to offer the motion to adopt the mitigated negative declaration and the mitigation monitoring and reporting program for the Vallejo Ferry Terminal Reconfiguration Project. I'll second. Okay, we have a motion and second. Uh, any further discussion? If not, uh, call roll, please. Sure, Wonderman. Yes. Vice Chair Boyer. Yes. Director Alba. Yes. Director Del Bono. Yes. Director Yes. Thank you. So item eight ties to item seven, the actual approving of the of Vallejo Ferry Terminal Reconfiguration uh, Project. I'm assuming there's no further. Uh, Staff reporting on it. Could I take a motion? I would love. Uh, Chair Winman, you need a public comment on, on this. Oh, yeah. uh, well, <laughs> let's take a motion. <clears throat> I can't see the name. Natalie Peterson. No, okay, thank you. Natalie Peterson, please. Hi, yes, thank you all. Good afternoon, chair and board members. My name is Natalie Peterson and I am the assistant to the city manager for the city of Vallejo. And I am here today to voice um, our strong staff support for the Vallejo Ferry Terminal Reconfiguration Project. As you are all very aware, the San Francisco Bay Ferry provides an essential service between Vallejo and downtown San Francisco, carrying nearly 660,000 passengers in 2023. The success and reliability of these services are vital to our community and the citizens here in Vallejo. Um, the former speaker, Ms. Marina, touched on most of my talking points, so I won't state them again. But I would like to note that um, WIDA did come and present to City Council at a meeting on May 28th and received favorable input from the City Council and the community. The Vallejo Ferry Terminal Configuration Project is critical investment in our community's transportation infrastructure and for the future development of Mare Island, the Vallejo waterfront and downtown areas. It promises to enhance ferry services, reliability, improve passenger experiences, and ensure the long-term sustainability of this vital transit route. I urge you all to support this project and help us move forward towards a more efficient passenger-friendly ferry service. Uh, thank you all for your time and consideration of this project. Uh, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, I think we uh, appreciate how important this project mm -hmm. is to uh, Vallejo and our most widely uh, used and highly regarded service. Mm -hmm. um, Director Dude, did you want to make that motion? Yes, please. I would love to make the motion to approve the Vallejo Ferry Terminal Reconfiguration Project. And I'll second that too. Director Alba seconds. Uh, any further public comment or discussion? If not, call the roll, please. Uh, Chair Wonderman. Yes. Vice Chair Boyer. Yes. Director Alba. Yes. Director Dobo. Yes. Director Yes. All right. Congratulations. <laughs> Off we go to the work. That's gonna be. Uh, item number nine: Name Dorado class vessels three and four. <laughs> Wonderman, Vice Chair Moyer, Directors. Um, I'm Lexi Matsui from the Communication Staff. 
As you know, San Francisco Bay Ferry is expecting its third and fourth uh, Dorado class vessels to be joining the fleet in 2025 and 2026. Back in November, the board approved a naming policy to determine what we would call these vessels. So today I'd like to present you with the naming options that we've garnered from that policy. So keeping with the policy, staff collected name nominations from kindergarten through 12th graders uh, in any of the nine Bay Area counties from mid-May to about mid-June. Nominations were solicited through outreach to all of the school groups who had recently traveled on the ferry on a tour and through social media marketing and some radio interviews. Um, we had nearly 300 nominations submitted and from there we eliminated the names that were duplicates or did not follow our policy guidelines. And then a staff panel to met to narrow that list down to a final 12. Uh, we then opened that voting um, for those 12 finalists to the public, we received over 3,300 3, votes. Uh, the name Carl was our top finisher by far. It garnered more than 1,200 votes. That name was submitted by a 10th grader named Sean, who nominated it because Carl the Ferry would be at home cruising through the fog. Um, so the next two finalists were very close. Those are Bay Dull. Uh, with 417 votes. That was nominated by a first grader named Jules because it's fun. And Chowder was third place with 416 votes. That was nominated by sixth grader Brett, who said this is a classic San Francisco dish that we are very much known for. Uh, the students who submitted the winning names will be winning a one-year pass to write the ferry for them and their families. So today we're asking the board to approve the name Carl for the third uh, Dorado class vessel. And we're also asking you to vote between bagel and chowder. Wow. Um, <laughs> I remember when we discussed the, the uh, naming policy, but I, you know, I didn't, who thought we'd be here today? So I, I have a question. Uh, first of all, congratulations on, uh, you know, taking us through this process and seeing all this, uh, you know, obviously, uh, inspired input uh, who who is carl carl is the name of our city's fog okay uh, carl carl, oh. carl the fog <laughs> you guys have probably heard from carl referred to uh okay. it's a fairly new name i grew up in the bay and didn't didn't know it was a thing until oh, 10, 15 mm -hmm. years ago but yeah i thought it might be carl the intern from phineas and ferb for anyone who has kids because <laughs> uh, i i didn't know that yeah well that one would also be yeah in the fog i'm sure uh, Carl was always in that. So, um, members, uh, you know, I, I think this is a great, it's a great list. And actually, you know, some great uh, suggestions uh, were made and uh, you know, a lot of creative kids. Yeah. Folks, what, what's your thoughts, board members? I'm going with Chowder. I'm going with, yeah. So first and foremost, thank you for doing this. How fun! And, um, the twelve, the twelve no, no, nominees uh, are really, really good. We stop talking. Um, <laughs> Let's have order, please. Yeah, order. <laughs> the fan die. Uh, I'm gonna also go with chowder because even as you were talking, Alexis, it sounded like you were saying bagel, not bagel. <laughs> that is the point. That is the point. No. That is the point. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, and so, uh, yeah, I just picture a soggy piece of bread. So uh, I would really love chowder. Okay, so do we have three votes for chowder? Well, there's five of you. So we, have, I think we're. I guess we'll. Yeah, why don't we take? Why don't we start with take, take, Carl? Okay, first. I guess let's let's take a vote on whether you guys are approving Carl for the. So is there a motion? We need a motion and a second on. Is this an action or is it? I think it is. Yeah. yeah. The board. The, you know, we, we decided that it would be up to the board. So, now I wonder if we should have. But <laughs> right, yeah. So seeing, I, when I read through this, it, it made perfect sense. But as I'm sitting here, our ships are, are, are email, like, right? We, we call them she and her. And I'm not saying to change anything. I just want us to recognize that Carla is also a name, and Carla could ride through or the, the fog. Um, but um, that is a good point. I, yeah. I have not heard Carl the fog necessarily referred to as a gendered Carl. However, 
So that's true too. So we're, let's assume that it's uh, yeah. So, so non I don't know that we need to part. Yeah. yeah. I don't know. I like fog that. itself is okay. necessarily not. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're very good on the feet there. Yeah, <laughs> you're super. But thank, thank you. I, I was thinking of that too. And you know, but we can't have both Carl and Carla. We can still refer to MB Carl as a she when we when we talk to her. Right. Mm -hmm. principles, I believe. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah. 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 Uh, do we have a motion on Carl? Some of. Second, yeah. Motion and a second. Public comment on. I think we should take public comment on Carl. Does anyone uh, want? Up. Anybody signed up? Signed up. Anyone not signed up wish to sign up? Okay, hearing hearing none. Let's let's move to the second name. So let's take that. We'll what take the two saying? motions. So we have a motion. Do we have a motion on chowder? I think. No, I think. Yeah. So uh, the only thing I was wondering is like if there are um, because when we were writing back after the last board meeting and, and some of the names were being discussed, the captain was mentioning that they have meanings, um, some of them like rough seas or whatnot. And I don't know if chowder means rough seas. Just wanted to like throw that out there. Like um, some topic. Mm -hmm. We did the 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 staff panel that met discussed kind of the the eligible options. We did kind of do some brief research to make sure that everything had the meanings that we thought they did. Yeah. Um, and we learned some things and we took some things off of the list. Okay. Um, so yeah, I, I I don't think that there's anything uh, too hidden with chowder or okay. bagel. It was vetted. But good good vetted. question. Yeah. Can I ask? Yeah, so we um the first two Dorado remind me of the so it's Dorado Dorado and Delphin. Delphin, that's right. I should know that. Mm -hmm. yeah. But then, they make love. Yeah. I think we have split. Yeah. Are we gonna sit so here for an hour? <laughs> do we want? Do we want to move on Carl first and then go to the other sure. name? Yeah. You prefer think we're that? All united on. All right. Carl. So I, I think we got a motion to second that, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So and we have no more public comment from where I could see. So. Let's call the roll on Carl. Sure, Carl the Bob. Yes. Vice Chair Boyer. Yes. Director Alpha. Yes. Director Del Bono. Yes. Director Dave. Yes. <laughs> I'll just say in arrears, it's going to take some explaining. I mean, all of this, right? Right. You know, because we're really changing gears here on <laughs> how we do things. And so there's going to be a lot of questions about what this is called. Good. You know, if, if I didn't know, conversation. no one knows that. But it, it's good. I'm not. Okay, let's move on to uh, chowder and bagel. So did we have a motion on, some, on something? Anybody move, want to move one of those two? I'll make a motion for chowder. Motion on chowder. What's our what's our ability to pick from the list? <laughs> you have total asking, ability. Asking for a friend. You have, you have total ability to pick or make up another name. Make up the These no, are okay. uh, the port. Bagel and chowder were the two closest public votes. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. So I think we would need to, you know, uh, really justify if we decided to go in another direction. But you guys are, of course, the board and um, we would hear hear those justifications. Yeah, I think con consistent with the policy, we've we've made recommendations and vetted these set of names, but the board is free to select from any of these names or also choose a different name as long as it's consistent with the with the policy. And and I will say that there were uh, a few finalist names uh, with kind of native based origins that we, we considered. And per uh, Executive Director Murphy's recommendation, we got in touch with the Executive Director of the Association of Ramitish Ohlone, and he sort of educated us on, on better ways to approach a naming convention with those types of titles. Um, given that this was a wide open student-led nomination process, we felt it was not appropriate to include those names in the, in the finalist list, but we would love to find ways to collaborate with those communities in the future. Thank you. Yeah, you know, I'll, I'll comment when I read this list, my reaction, and it, it came somewhat to Director Alba's point, um, is I didn't know who Carl was. So I just figured Carl was a cute name that somebody suggested and everybody liked and, and so forth. But it made, when I looked at the 
going down the list, it made me think uh, when when I we did a trip there. Council did a trip to uh, to to the UK, to Portsmouth and Southampton, in order to look at uh, uh, what are those boats called? The ones we did the study about. Hover what do you call them? Just name hovercraft. hovercraft. So we went to see hovercraft, and we did. We rode on hovercraft, but they have two types of vessels that cross that bay, and the other type are diesel powered vessels. And one of them was, um, you know, we Nina and I rode on it, and we were very impressed by it. And it's so that was the, what happened that resulted in Maverick Marine coming up as an idea for them building our future vessel. And we talked to them. And they showed an interest and they were willing to open up a facility to uh, build a vessel and they did and you know i think we we've been pretty satisfied and now we're you know we took a contract to build two boats into a contract to build four boats and uh and now we're naming the third and the fourth boat and you know we we had a direct a person here who was the director of the organization from its onset uh, who really did a lot to kind of get us here uh, you know, sort of the first daughter. Her, her name was Nina. And I, I kind of think we want to name a boat some, you know, I know we're not supposed to name boats after people. We sort of agree to do that. But Nina's a little innocuous because people say, well, who's Nina? If they like, they're going to say, who's Carl? So I won't make the motion. But if anyone else wants to make the motion, if we want to go off this list, I think she's, you know, for this particular vessel, that she really had a lot to do making this vessel happen this set of four vessels, you know, it wouldn't be, in my view, inappropriate to name name a vessel after her. And uh, and and then we can go back to not naming vessels after people for a while. But anyway, is it, does anyone see it that way? Can I say something? Sure, yeah, absolutely. We, we agreed to do a process as a board, and this is the process we did. We had these kids pick names. I don't, I don't feel, I don't feel comfortable moving away from the process. I mean, in the future, it's fine, but this process, right. We we agreed to do. We we had students put time into it. They 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 went out there. They're excited about it. I I feel like, you know, we 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 owe it to them to to follow through with this process and pick the name. And I, I understand that. You know, right? I feel. One thing I will note is that the name the name for the third vessel we do need soon. They need to print that on certain. We need, of we need it today. We already we need it. Today. Yeah. And that's why why we're coming to you so early. Yeah. The fourth vessel we do have a little more time for. So I guess we do have an option. Well, we we have a motion on chowder, right? Did we get? We have a second. We have a second. This is not it, right? Did we? We don't have a second yet. We didn't have a second yet. Okay. So for further further discussion then. So do we I'd like to blow this myself, and I think it's within yeah. the range of being. Yeah. I was thinking exactly. Lyrical, lyrical name. Yep. Mm -hmm. And that is and the scientific name of the California sea lion. Yeah. How do you, Alexis, pronounce it again? I think it's Zalathus. I like the way I pronounce it better, but it's sweet to call it. Uh, I would make a motion for Salapus. That's an Okay. Motion on Salapus. I'm going to second that. And there's a second. We're going to have a motion that the board not be involved in this. Yeah. <laughs> oh, we're doing our job. This is a hard job. Uh, other comments from the board on Salapus? Members of the public on Salapus? Anyone? Uh, I like it. <laughs> yes. You want to comment, Melanie? You can comment too. You know. yeah. You're a member of the public today. I like the scientific. Yeah. Okay, we have a motion and a second, so call the roll, please. Chair Wonderman. Yes. Vice Chair Boyer. Yes. Director Alba. Yes. Director Delbo. Yes. Director Duke. Yes. That's a really cool name. <laughs> and let's... Uh, no, not I'll yet. Unless you want another naming. No, I want to. You got to stay right out of this. No, with boards in it. And I, I want to just say, you know, to the all of the kids who participated, you know, we appreciate their uh, creativity and their, uh, you know, their excitement about being part of this. And, you know, naming things is always hard. You know, you think about having a kid and what you go through over months, you know, and all the different lists of names and so forth. So I think we actually did pretty well. And I uh, congratulate. And I, and I think, uh, 
Director Moyer, you, you, Vice Chair Moyer, you did a nice job calling out Zalabas. I think yeah. it's a good, good name. All right, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Nice work. Appreciate it. Okay, item 10, Oakland Alameda Water Shuttle Pilot Project Update. This this one is informational. Whew, that's a... It's probably oh, going after that. Yeah. It's very entertaining, by the way. <laughs> Let's <laughs> rename Mike to uh, Chowder. And then she would be very well-deserving of it. Yeah. Yeah, um, yeah uh, so this is a naming uh, competition for the water shuttle service. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, that one has enough. <laughs> uh, so July is unofficially pilot month at WIDA. Um, as Shaman has mentioned, we've got the Redwood City Ballpark Service launching on July 28th. Sea change right around the corner, a big event tomorrow. And our third project, uh, the Alameda Oakland Water Shuttle Service, poised to launch on July 17th, which I believe is a Wednesday. Next week. Um, and so everyone's really excited. Uh, there's a lot of excitement in my hometown of Alameda. Uh, lots of uh, talk about it and buzz on various threads and blogs and everything. Um, and this project uh, has been the coordination of so many different parties. Uh, obviously, WIDA, City of Alameda, uh, we've also worked closely with the CIM the Property Management Group at Jack London Square, Alameda Transportation Management Authority, as well as the Port of Oakland. Um, so a lot of coordination, volumes of insurance certificates, uh, and a lot of work that's gone into this. Um, so uh, on the eve of the service launching, uh, we'd like to take the opportunity just to review uh, some of the goals and objectives of the service. Um, and these will be really the basis and the lens through which we we look at the service um, one to one and a half to two years from now what it, as it wraps up and make an assessment about whether we set out to accomplish what we are looking to do or not. Um, so this is a, a, a list of goals that have been vetted with the pilot service committee, um, Director Dew and Director Del Bono, um, and really uh, the template for what we'd like to do for pilots in general going forward. Um, and so I'll invite Dave to come up and, and walk you through what we have. Thank you. Okay, so as Mike mentioned, this is going to be an update about the Oakland Alameda Water Shuttle pilot project um, and walking through kind of the goals and objectives of the project, which will ultimately culminate in a final report that staff prepares in coordination with uh, City of Alameda the staff who are also working with them. Okay. So just some background to remind everybody, this is going to be a two-year limited-term project um, with pilot service between Alameda Landing and Jack London Square in Oakland. Um, it's a partnership uh, between City of Alameda, WIDA, and various other stakeholders that uh, provided funding commitments uh, to the project. And Kind of this whole effort was born out of a 2009 comprehensive study that looked at potential ways to cross the estuary in the short, medium, and long term. And the water shuttle service was identified as the medium term best solution. So it's going to be about $1.5 to $2 million in annual operating costs. And the service schedule to begin with is going to be four to five days a week, nine to 12 hours per day. Um, and initially it's going to be a very robust schedule with opportunities to adjust during the pilot as demand, as we see fit, um, demand, et cetera. And of course, first day of revenue service coming up on July 17th. So an overview of kind of how we got here. Um, previously, when we had done pilots in the past, there was kind of an ad hoc, no formal process to evaluate them. Um, internally, staff and uh, Seamus, we discussed having kind of a process in place so that we could at the beginning, know what we were trying to achieve, and at the end, have a roadmap for what the final report would look like. So this new process establishes goals, objectives, and evaluation metrics in partnership with the board and our project partners. Um, during the project, we're going to monitor um, kind of the performance of the service and then collect data, qualitative and quantitative, uh, to inform the final report. And then as part of this process, we're also going to bring regular updates back to the board, uh, to the various stakeholders. And then at the very end, we're going to, again, culminate this in a final report, and it's going to have recommendations for potential next steps. So we established with the City of Alameda partners nine different goals for the project. 
Um, the first five are here. So we have one, assess the long-term project demand. We're going to collect ridership data during the project uh, to inform both the potential for a permanent service as well as adjustments that might be able to be made during the course of the pilot. Uh, number two is optimize the service operations. Um, so this ties back into the first one. We're going to periodically adjust kind of the hours of operation, cycle times to match what the demand looks like as we begin the service. Um, and then kind of evaluating the project partnership model. Um, so this effort was kind of a very unique way to approach a pilot project. We've never done something like this in the past. Um, and so evaluating to see if this process works moving forward is something that we're going to look at. Um, and then number four, estimating the cost for a permanent service. Um, this includes kind of any initial and ongoing capital and operating costs. Number five, um, the goal here is to close the gap in the bike and ped network. And this was something that City of Alameda has been looking at for many, many years. Um, and so we're going to see if this water shuttle actually achieved that goal that they set out to do. First. Um, number six, we have promoting economic development, um, both on the Oakland side in Jack London and on the Alameda side in Alameda Landing. Um, and then this is going to include kind of a polling of nearby businesses to see kind of what the impact of the water shuttle has had on their, um, their uh, on their business. Number seven, we're going to determine the communities that are served, kind of evaluate who's taking the shuttle. Um, and what are the potential kind of future financial contributions that we might be able to leverage for a permanent service? Um, and then number eight is to be transparent, right? We have all this data that we're going to collect through the pilot. We're going to make that available to the board, to our partners in Alameda, and to the public. And then number nine is to pursue potential electrification of this route. Um, and so Considering using outboard motors that are electric on this vessel is an option, um, and then testing that feasibility as well. And then these goals are also outlined in the attachment um, in more detail. So the second half of kind of the report here is the performance metrics. These are kind of the specific points of data that we're going to be collecting throughout the pilot project and how that'll inform the final report. So we have um, criteria number one, which is the ridership, looking at how many people are riding, how many bikes are riding, what's the profile and distribution of riders, um, and then kind of what are the origins and destinations that people are looking to go to. Um, second criteria we have is for operations, looking at the on-time performance of the service, how reliable is the service, how many trips are we performing per day, um, are there any reports of safety incidents or reports of cancellation, um, the number three is finance. Um, so we're going to look at the hourly operating costs, how it shakes out compared to the system, and then the subsidy per rider that we're providing. And then the next criteria here, we have customer experience and looking at the satisfaction of the riders who are using the service. Uh, and then looking at kind of the complaints or compliments that we get from riders as well. Uh, the next criteria we have is economic impact. Um, this is involving the survey of nearby businesses and employers in the catchment area. Uh, next, we have the environmental impact, kind of estimating the VMT reduction and potential emissions avoided. Um, this includes kind of all those um, trips that people might have been making by car otherwise. Um, the next one we have is equity, right? Looking at the number of low income riders that were uh, that are using the service compared to both we system wide and within the catchment area. And then finally, kind of looking at the partnership and coordination model, um, going back to the partners after the fact and seeing kind of, you know, doing a postmortem, what worked, what didn't, um, what were the roles that worked, um, was the level of effort kind of congruent with what we delivered. And of course, the full details of all the ridership or all, of all the criteria and performance metrics are also available in the full report. So shifting gears, the there has been kind of a robust public outreach and marketing plan that Tom's group has um, put together for the service. Um, it's a collaborative effort between City of Alameda, the Alameda TMA, as well as the real estate group, um, Jack London Square. And we, uh, we have committed 50,000 in in-kind marketing support and staff time to this effort. Um, and the marketing plan includes 
kind of a multi-pronged approach. We have media really a media relations strategy. There's going to be doc signage. There's going to be onboard passenger information, online information, as well as events and programming um, that happen on the service as well. And so last but not least, I know this is a long kind of presentation. Um, we have kind of the plan for how we're going to collect all of the data and report it. Um, so we're going to be tracking the operational data. So this includes our Swiftly system, which um, we currently use to track all of our ridership and operations data, GTFS real time, and then the existing leader ridership dashboard, which is where we export all of the charts that um, you see in the monthly director's report for the ridership report. Um, and then City of Alameda has agreed to lead the development of surveys to be administered during the pilot period. Uh, and then we'll, of course, come back to the board periodically with updates and, about operational statistics. Um, and then the project team is also going to update City of Alameda as well. And then finally, um, our staff here are going to lead the preparation of a final report at the conclusion of the pilot project, which will kind of take a look back at all of the goals and objectives that we've uh, established here and see how we performed and kind of what the next steps are. With that, that's all I have. Happy to take any questions. Uh, thanks, Gabe. Yeah. Um, questions, uh, comments from the board? It's interesting to see this was the that this service is the product of a study from 2009, mm -hmm. which just shows you know great ideas sometimes take time to really hatch. But uh, excited to see it in action, and uh, it's very uh, you know it's reinforcing to see the thought process that's going into not just putting the service out there, but mm -hmm. measuring just about everything that would be relevant to see how it performs. You know, for the future of the project itself and, and I know the projects like it. So thank, thank you for that. I think it, it's very comprehensive. I mean, I really appreciate all the thought that's gone into it and, and sort of the template that's being created here for other pilots. So, so thank you all for the work that's gone into this. Looking forward to seeing how it comes together and plays out. I'm will, ready, ready, ready. Will there be an event to... Uh, on the 17th? I think they are planning a media event. I'll be, out, I'll be out of town. Otherwise, I would have gone, but I, I hope somebody from the board can, can go. Um, the, the last I've heard, and, and uh, we're working in partnership with the city on the marketing promotion effort, but they're really the lead on it. Um, they're looking to do kind of a soft launch uh, at, at the actual launch of the service and, and more of a ribbon cutting event. Um, in the September timeframe. Okay. Um, so there'll be a, a, a first run of the service that um, tentatively the, the mayor of Alameda and the city council of Alameda are planning. They did send an announcement um, via news release out uh, last week on Friday, um, probably not ideal timing for maximum yeah, coverage. I saw a lot of coverage of it. Uh, I saw a little bit. Um, yeah, I yeah. saw quite a bit. It was on television like crazy. Oh, really? Okay. Oh, yeah, they covered, covered the heck out of it. That's yeah. good. good. So they, they yeah they have uh, uh, then been getting some good exposure. Um, hopefully that will continue. Uh, in regards to the schedule, um, is this the schedule um, of service? Are are these uh, recommendations coming from our operators, or is it something that's developed by the? City? I'm just looking for instance. There's a big gap between. 3 and 5 p.m., for instance, and, and so there are a few gaps in the middle of the day um, and service ending at 8 p.m. So this relates to cruise ships and just financial reasons, or who would? I was under the impression it was a, like a crew break time mm -hmm. limitation, yeah. Yeah, uh, so a lot of factors. Um, the the gaps in the service are driven by exactly that, the, the crew break times mm -hmm. and their prescribed lunch breaks and, uh, and other breaks that happen throughout the day. Um, and then, um, you know, one of the limitations uh, in the project is the amount of funding available yeah. and the desire to stretch it over as long a period as possible. Um, in an ideal world, you'd have another crew available um, to plug those gaps in the, the break schedule. 
Um, but because of budget constraints, we're only doing one crew in the morning, one crew in the afternoon. Mm -hmm. And so when they're on lunch, there's no one available to do the service. Right. Uh, in terms of hours and, and days of operation, for that matter, um, you know, again, working within budget constraints. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, you know, one of the, the things we're doing with the goals and objectives is potentially laying the case uh, to build the argument to do a, a more robust permanent service down the road. Yeah. Um, and that would look different than what we have uh, as a pilot here. First of all, it would operate, you know, all seven days of the week. Yeah. And then the hours of operation would be potentially longer with uh, more robust service if the information we get uh, suggests that that investment is Okay. And then, um, so the headway is roughly, or it is 30 minutes from Alameda, every 30 minutes from Oakland. Um, but I think this, the actual crossing is how many minutes? Um, it's speculative at this point. Okay. And, and so um, this has been a, a topic of a lot of discussion amongst the project team working on this. Um, where we landed, um, we want to take kind of a conservative approach mm -hmm. in terms of travel time. Uh, put out a schedule that we know we can make. Okay. Um, so that is, is, uh, we have a high degree of reliability. And so when people are, are showing up at a scheduled time to um, meet or get on the, the ferry, um, it's there. Mm -hmm. um, what we're going to use with the Swiftly system, mm -hmm. um, and, and that gives us the ability to, to real, in real time track um, the movements and the progress of the vessel, is um, we're, we're going to hopefully see that we're, we've got lots of cushion there. Mm -hmm. And then at that point, um, you know, after a period of months, potentially uh, the project team would make a decision to revise the schedule mm -hmm. and hopefully tighten up those headways and offer mostly more trips over the same. Okay. Um, but we, we, we wanted to, we're deliberately starting out specifically. Yeah. And we've um, honestly gotten some public comments about that. Yeah. Some some media inquiries as well, and we've explained the approach, and and I think people have been largely kind of satisfied with. It. Yeah. As long as we keep in mind that with the thirty minute frequency, we might lose ridership, right? So if it's if it ends up being, it just keeps going back and forth, and you see the boat crossing, and uh, you might, you, you anticipate it's going to come back, you know, a few people getting on and, you know, it's going to be there within a few minutes, uh, we might increase ridership. And so the 30 minute frequency is uh, a bit of a concern for me personally. Um, but I understand it's a great start as long as we take these factors into account when we evaluate the service. Thank you. I'm Thank you. I'm Good so point. excited. I'm I want to get on a ferry to the shuttle. Great. Mm -hmm. uh, members of the public, Melanie, on on uh, item ten. No one has signed up to to email this. Anyone wish uh, who's here or on our virtual screen wish to uh, comment? Okay, th thank you very much. We're uh, very excited uh, about the prospect of this service. Uh, item 11, Treasure Island Ferry Study. Good afternoon, uh, board. Uh, so another information item kind of coming at you, um, an update on the Treasure Island Ferry Service, which is a really exciting project we're working on. Um, it's a project uh, that we just included in its 2050 service vision and expansion policy um, that the board just approved last May. Um, it's also a centerpiece of phase one of our reprogram. Um, so the, the agency's programmatic effort to, to electrify the system. Um, Treasure Island, as well as the, um, the, the connecting mission Bay service, are really the first two projects that we're anticipating to go forward uh, with in terms of launching zero emission electric battery, uh, battery electric service. Um, so uh, we, this, this item is to give you an update on, a, on some work that we've been doing in partnership with the San Francisco County Transportation Authority, acting as the Treasure Island Mobility Management Agency mm -hmm. uh, on a ferry feasibility study to really um, advance what has been kind of a, a, a concept of Treasure Island projects into something more tangible. Um, and we have uh, Swani Cho, uh, the Assistant Deputy Director of Planning here today, uh, to give a, uh, a similar presentation that I was given to the SFCTA board uh, last month. And so uh, my pleasure to turn it over to Swani and, and we'll both be available after the presentation to answer any questions.
Good um, afternoon, uh, Chair afternoon. and Directors. Uh, Swati Cho, I'm the Assistant Deputy Director for Planning at the uh, San Francisco County Transportation Authority. I'm here today wearing my TIMA hat as the Treasurer Island Mobility Management Agency. And thank you for this opportunity to present today. Great. Um, so today's presentation is really to just update you uh, quickly on ferry service to Treasure Island, including the planning study, which we worked on primarily in 2022, now concluded. Um, and we, I wanted to also uh, update you on some significant developments in the ferry world since then, uh, which seems like a long time ago, hmm. um, and talk about our next step, which is the business plan. So this is uh, just a sort of a very quick snapshot as you're are probably aware there's a lot of activity on Treasure Island today and on Yerba Buena Island. Um, there are it's a lot of housing going up. Nearly a thousand units will be uh, completed by the um, beginning of next year, um, and full build up on Treasure Island will be 8,000 units, of which 27% are affordable, and that is mm -hmm. uh, just about 10% of San Francisco's Rena um, housing commitment. Maceo May is a building that is fully. Uh, affordable or formerly homeless veterans. That's been um, occupied for a while now. There's a number of other affordable buildings in development. Um, Ida and the developer are busy with uh, $2.5 billion worth of infrastructure projects, including geotech improvements, uh, major new um, utilities, parks. A couple of parks have opened recently, Panorama Park with the um, uh, sculpture. And um, we, as the Transportation Authority, are um, also busy with a lot of uh, roadway projects um, on Yerba Buena, which incorporate transit and bicycle improvements as well. Um, that will obviously both uh, support on-island um, and interregional mobility. Uh, we've also opened some on and off ramps from the Bay Bridge uh, and the West Side Bridges project, which uh, is a seismic retrofit of uh, eight bridges, um, is currently under construction. We're also working to complete the funding plan for the multi-use path, which will bring bikes and pedestrians from the east end of the Bay Bridge down to the ferry terminal so that they can complete the Transbay trip on the new electric ferry. Um, and the master development agreement was uh, recently amended so that uh, ensures continued sort of uninterrupted uh, progress with all this construction. So just uh, showing a lot of momentum. Um, as an island, obviously, you know, water transit is a critical component of the mobility program. Um, in 2021, Tima and Lita signed an MOU to uh, work closely on this very planning study, and I um, sort of assumed responsibly for that, working closely with Mike. Um, we looked at demand projections, various scenarios of what the ferry service could look like, um, and how much funding we would need. Um, we projected ridership demand. You see some uh, sort of ranges of numbers here. And we um, uh, did some pre preliminary scenario planning. Um, I do want to note that the assumptions that we um, uh, used were based you know, in 2021, including the ridership numbers. Um, it also assumed a 2021 development schedule, which was um, has been um, revised since then. And um, it assumed things like the congestion management toll was in place um, and that the muni uh, that the ferry fare was 275. And that those are things that um, obviously sort of favor ridership. So as part of the business plan, we'll be updating all of those assumptions and projections. So uh, again, back in 2021, we uh, started with a very wide range of scenarios. We considered um, you know, peak only service uh, on weekdays, all the way to all day weekend, all day um, weekday service with uh, 30 minute frequencies. Um, and at the time when we started the car uh, regulation for zero emission service on short routes was not in, yet in place. So you can see we um, started with some diesel options. Um, then when the car mandate uh, was adopted, we took the diesel options off the table, and we really started looking at the uh, uh, scenarios three, four, and five, which were electric. Um, the uh, we focused in on scenarios three, uh, four, and five, where the estimated annual cost of operation was about three point two million for um, one vessel and about uh, twice that. Uh, there. 
those are the numbers we were looking at. Um, and we found that the cost per, per, per operating hour for the all day service was better, uh, if you know, more efficient than just doing the peak only. Um, then we uh, looked at some fair revenue uh, projections or estimates. Um, we used the we used elasticity factors to analyze the impact of the uh, kind of different range of uh, fares on ridership and operating budgets. And I will say that was a fairly um, simple analysis. Um, and so you can see it's sort of straight lineish, um, where as the cash fare um, goes up to five dollars. The uh, ridership goes down, but the actual revenue um, uh, 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 increases. So the point of this was to try to see what the operating shortfall would look like and um, what, therefore, what subsidies would be needed. So uh, we concluded based on the work we did with this uh, planning study that we should provide all day service seven days a week with at least hourly frequency when ridership is relatively low because uh, sort of occupancy of the island is relatively low and service levels would obviously increase as demand increases. Um, it was, the study was pretty valuable, um, although that seems sort of like a no brainer now for uh, providing the key outlines of this very service. So the next step really is to uh, uh, dig into the business plan where we can get to the level, next level of analysis. Um, we need to do a lot more work, I think, to um, refine the O&M costs um, with electric vessels, which is, relatively, is new to us, um, and uh, yeah. the ridership projections and calculate the subsidy that's needed. Um, Oh, I forgot to mention, uh, a key aspect of what we want to do is to define the roles and responsibilities of the various stakeholder parties, including TIMA, WIDA, um, IDA, uh, QC, et cetera. So switching gears a little bit, uh, here are a few slides on um, some updates uh, since 2021 when we started that planning study. Um, in 22, in March of 22, um, uh, the Master Developer began operating a ferry service um, that is privately funded, but open to the public. It runs every day and um, it has an average of one trip per hour, but the actual frequency is a little uneven, I think for the same reason that the um, Alameda service is uh, due to like breaks and such. Mm -hmm. um, the fare for this service is $5 one way with a monthly pass available for $150. Um, the ridership on this service it was initially quite low, uh, but it has increased with time and um, we are working to try to get um, sort of detailed ridership numbers so that that can help inform our planning for our service. Um, and I should also note that the service is very popular on weekends. Uh, it's very popular for events like Treasure Fest that um, just recently restarted uh, in February. So that has attracted something like 2000 riders in the first weekend. Um, uh, I don't need to spend time on this slide. This is a um, uh, major consideration, uh, of course, in our uh, business plan planning is uh, your service vision, which you adopted in May. Um, you know, we are aligned, I think, with all of the policies and sort of expansion um, uh, commitments there. And just noting that Treasure Island and Mission Bay Service is proposed in tier one. And this too, uh, electrification, you are very familiar with. Uh, we've been very happy to uh, support WIDA's um, uh, applications to uh, uh, various federal and state programs to secure over $127 million, which is amazing. Um, I believe the uh, Treasure Island route will be, uh, be the first, not one of the first, to be operated with the electric vessels. Um, and we look forward to seeing the RFP hit the street. Um, and we are also working with WIDA and TIDA on uh, permitting and building the electrical infrastructure, charging infrastructure at the uh, Treasure Island terminal. And so I think that is um, looking good. And we have a path forward. We do need that last piece of funding, which um, we're supporting uh, you, and we've put it in uh, various applications as well. 
So I think this is my last slide. Uh, we're just putting um, all of these pieces together to develop this business plan for the service. Um, we'll use the new demand numbers uh, derived from an updated uh, uh, model, which uh, will incorporate some new um, survey data on post-pandemic travel patterns. So that, I think that will be very valuable. Uh, we'll nail down the service plan. We will um, use the service plan to um, uh, better develop uh, the O&M costs. Um, and then I think the fair policy and fair structures will be a major topic of discussion. We want to make sure that um, it addresses, you know, uh, the sort of the full range of fair structures, including discounts, um, equity considerations, you know, uh, WIDA's policies, our uh, goals for sustainability, et cetera. Um, we're also uh, going to be looking at uh, fair payment scenarios and potentially uh, looking at uh, participation in MTC's uh, Bay Pass Fair program for uh, and uh, incorporating that into our affordability program and um, quantify the subsidy needed, um, the funding strategy for uh, operations. Um, in May, I think, I don't know if you're aware, we you already are, uh, the Transportation Authority uh, approved $1.6 million of STA block grant funding for the first year of, uh, to toward the first year of service for this. Um, and, um, think the roles and responsibilities, as I mentioned. So I think that is my presentation. I'm happy to take any questions. Um, it's, it's Thank you. It's a, it's a great uh, comprehensive report. Great to get the update. Um, in the early slide, when you talked about the assumptions, you know, there was a point where we were looking, we, were, we thought there'd be a toll. And uh, I think that went, I don't know if it went as far as the Board of Supervisors, but I think maybe it did. And then, so what's the state of affairs on that toll? The toll. Um, we are still working on uh, to sort of fully flesh out that policy. There have been some concerns about equity and uh, the impact on uh, low-income folks um, on Treasure Island because it is primarily it's an equity priority community. So we're still uh, trying to shape the affordability policies, and we it has not yet gone to the Board of Supervisors, um, but we are hoping to. Uh, do some further targeted outreach and get it to adoption. So. And then, um, you know, you mentioned the, you know, how you kind of shake out the stakeholder involvement. So, you know, the main stakeholders, I guess, would be the people who live, live on the island and or who have businesses on the island. So have they provided, you know, I, they don't live there yet, most of them. Um, is there a way to get input or what's the plan for, hearing from folks in terms of, you know, the trade-offs between frequency and fair and, you know, those, those kinds of things? Oh, uh, um, we have not yet. I, mean, I think doing some uh, public engagement will be part of the business plan process. Um, we have heard that uh, they would like, you know, residents would like other options. Currently, the only transit option is uh, the 25 Muni. Um, and so I think having kind of additional alternatives and, especially ones where you don't have to uh, sit on the bridge, uh, would be welcome. Would be good. Um, comments, questions from the board? Any? Um, just, um, this is fantastic. I'm, I worked on this project many, many years ago as a consultant on the TBM plan, so it's exciting to see new development come in. Um, do we, do you, is there any estimate for when the toll infrastructure would be in place and possibly start generating revenue? Um, I can't say. I think it, you know, we still have to uh, uh, finish designing and then constructing and implementing the system. We need obviously the adoption at the local level. Um, so it's probably at least a couple of years before we could turn it on yeah. at the earliest. Yeah, and and I just wanted to echo what um, Gary Wonderman just said as well regarding surveying existing users and uh, residents and and trying to figure out how we can how we can support behavior change and 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 from an equity perspective as well um, with the Bay Pass program. Um, 
I, I, I completely understand how hard it is when you have really long hours at work and you meet it up at 4.30 in the morning and hop on in your car to get to your workplace and get home late at night. Um, but providing really excellent transit, water transit in this case, in addition to Muni, yep. um, is really what's going to make a difference. So really working on how to make that happen from an equity perspective, especially. Okay. Any uh, comments from the public? Melanie, anyone signed up on the yes, item? Yes, we have. Good. Oh. Uh, Andy Wang. Uh, good afternoon, Chair Wonderman and board members. Uh, my name is Andy Wang. I am a senior development manager at Treasure Island Development Group. I am here speaking on behalf of TIDG to express strong support for the recommendations put forward by Treasure Island Mobility Management Authority staff. Treasure Island is in the midst of a decades long transformation from a former Navy base to a lead platinum San Francisco neighborhood with 8,000 units of housing, 27% of which will be affordable. The plan was originally approved in 2011, and after a significant amount of upfront investment in, in infrastructure, about a thousand homes are now either complete or under construction. In order to jumpstart this new neighborhood and to ensure it had a high level of transit service from day one, EIDG, through partnership with Prop SF, has been privately operating an interim ferry service available to the public since 2022. We're incredibly pleased with having spearheaded this new seven minute connection between Treasure Island and downtown San Francisco, and we've watched ridership increase steadily over time. And yet, we're very excited for this ferry route to be operated in the long term by Timma and San Francisco Bay Ferry to ensure that the public can continue to rely on a high and consistent level of service. Permanent ferry service on this route is absolutely fundamental to the vision for Treasure Island and vital to its success as a new and sustainable San Francisco neighborhood. The very planning study presented by Tim staff has provided a comprehensive and forward uh, thinking roadmap for launching a new San Francisco Bay Ferry service in 2026. The key recommendations from the study proposing incremental phasing of service, offering all day service, and utilizing smaller vessels and electric vessels are well considered and strategically sound. We commend the shared goal of Tima and San Francisco Bay Ferry to launch the service in 2026. We likewise look forward to the critical next step of preparing a business plan, including updated ridership projections, fair structures, operating costs, funding strategy, and additional important implementation details. The IDG is encouraged by the findings of the ferry planning study and fully supports the outlined recommendations. These recommendations not only provide a clear path forward, but also reflect a commitment to sustainable, efficient, and accessible transportation for Treasure Island and the broader San Francisco Bay Area. Thank you for your time and consideration. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, anyone else? I see hands raised, but uh, other folks who signed up in advance? Alex, you did you want? Sure. Um, Alex. Go ahead with Alex, and I see chance. Alex, why don't you come up? Good afternoon, Chairman, Board. Uh, my name is Alex Kriska. I operate San Francisco Bay. I operate San Francisco Bay Ferry. I wish. <laughs> Damn, you really have to do You can apply. Uh, I run Prop SF, and we've been running the Treasure Island Ferry since uh, March of 2021. We've been very proud to do that. Uh, I was just looking at some numbers just recently where you just broke the 20% fare box recovery with Treasure Fest coming on. Uh, we've been running the boat seven days a week since 2021. Putting, putting in the hours on that little boat of ours. She runs about 100 round trips per week. Um, the weekends have turned out to be the big money makers for us. Weekdays are still um, slow and coming, but it's been a, a great a great service for us. And we'd be happy to help to provide any information uh, for you guys as you, as you move forward. And we certainly like to be part of it moving forward and staying with it. That's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Chance, Bre uh, Chance Bresky. 
Uh, thank you very much. And I apologize for not registering in advance. This was a bit of a short notice ask for me. Uh, I'm here on behalf of Seamless Bay Area. And Andy said it very well. I just want to echo his comments. Um, I'd refer you to the letter that Seamless Bay Area sent in support. This is really just a fantastic opportunity, we feel, for Weta. It's an opportunity to get in on the ground floor uh, as Treasure Island grows and develops with, um, you know, all of the new housing units that are moving in there. And it's also just a fantastic way for Weta to really on a very appealing time frame, work towards its goals of connecting the greater Bay area across the water. Um, it's, it's really a no brainer. Uh, we're definitely very impressed with the fantastic work that what a staff have put into, uh, the business plan here. And, you know, we're in strong support. We want to see this move forward and we are very enthused, uh, to see where this goes in the future. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. And, and we did, uh, indeed uh, received the letter from uh, Seamless Bay Areas. Thank you for commenting. Any other uh, members of the public wish to comment on item 11? Well, th you know, thank you. I, I think I, I was working on the Treasure Island project when I worked for Diane Feinstein in the 1980s, <laughs> and then again for Frank Jordan in the 1990s. And, you know, it's great to see, you know, good things take time. And this is a, this is a really big, important, uh, project for San Francisco and for the Bay Area. And uh, as was stated, uh, you know, ferry service, water transit service is absolutely a critical element. We have to do it and we have to uh, do it right. And, you know, you know, thank you, uh, Alex and, uh, and Prop SF for running the, running the service and setting the stage. And, you know, I think it's important for we to, uh, uh, you know, play an important role in making sure that you know, the people who live on Treasure Island or visit Treasure Island or when businesses on Treasure Island have, a, you know, a reliable, cost-effective means of uh, going back and forth uh, to the mainland of the Bay Area without uh, subjecting themselves to the, uh, you know, to the questionable experience of the Bay Bridge. And then it's, you know, we're able to have people experience transportation uh, that they can afford. So this is a, this is really important. And so thank you uh, for your work on it. And we'll, uh, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll keep it going and look forward to uh, uh, christening that one too. Thank you so much. Else. Thank you. Yeah, and I just, I just want to add, this is, um, I'm really excited about this because I've worked on Treasure Island what, uh, for a very long time, sitting at stint on the board there. This is critical to our responsibilities for emergency response. Um, so I'm really, I'm really happy to see it. I'm, I'm very happy that process does this is there to uh, assist in the event that that we needed to to fulfill those responsibilities as it relates um, to the island. But having lived through um, uh, needing to get people across the bay when the bridge was out of service, um, I cannot under overstate enough how critical that service is going to be. So thank you all for making this a priority. Mm -hmm. Was mentioned. Um... The funding, the additional funding needed on the electrification. So, you know, we've got funding, but we don't have all the funding we need. And we have a grant application uh, in, and you know, thank you, uh, folk, you know, you, you know, folks in this room and Tim and others for, you know, stepping up and prioritizing that. But Seamus, what's the status status of that? Uh, we're waiting for congressional appropriations to be finalized. It's been submitted by some key members of the Bay Area's delegation and. Um, we've seen that strategy work for other projects in the last couple of years. So uh, as long as that bill is uh, is approved um, and it makes its way through conference without yeah. any cuts to congressionally requested um, spending requests, then we uh, we will have a fully funded electrification component for the Treasure Island Terminal. Is that as I I think it was in the uh, in the legislative report? It says, uh, is it an earmark? Is it especially designated? It is. It is. Okay. Okay, uh, thank you. Anything else from board members on, on item 11? All right, good, great report. Uh, 12, draft sustainability policy. Good afternoon again, uh, board of directors, Sarthi Kruban and Ben Flanagan. Um, so this is an information item. Uh, we have a presentation. Uh, so what we are bringing today to the board is a draft um, sustainability policy. 
Um, and this is in response to uh, the stakeholder input that we received during the uh, business plan outreach, specifically on focus area number three, environmental stewardship. And uh, uh, so we have proposed a draft policy, which is uh, attached to the staff report. And uh, we would like to hear the board's feedback and uh, um, incorporate those comments and bring the final uh, version back to the board for requesting for adoption in the next month. Um, joining me today to present one of the critical pieces of the policy is uh, Terence Campbell, our uh, government and regulatory affairs versions. Uh, with that, I will jump into the Uh, so here's an overview of the agenda that we're going to cover today. Uh, I'll start off with uh, what the key influences were for developing the sustainability policy. Um, so reflecting back on the 2016 strategic plan, uh, we had set some uh, ambitious goals to achieve with respect to environmental stewardship. And we have uh, successfully met them and uh, continue to strive to make um, further improvements in these uh, areas. Uh, there are a lot of uh, regulations that speak to reducing emissions and promoting electrification. Uh, what we have uh, highlighted here, the slide is those that are more relevant and specific to our ferry industry. Uh, for example, the CARBs, uh, CSC regulations that speak to uh, reducing emissions and use of cleaner technology for commercial vessels. Um, the other factor uh, is also looking ahead with our 2050 business plan. Um, as you can see, there are these six core components of the business plan that's listed here. And uh, this includes uh, the service vision and expansion policy that the board adopted in May. Um, and that uh, sets the stage for uh, the draft sustainability policy when it comes to the environmental goals. Um, and um, uh, it aligns, as I said, with the uh, service mission that we adopted. Uh, one other key factors is also uh, from our past surveys and outreach. What we have learned is that our riders um, uh, take the ferry uh, because of the environmental uh, benefits that it offers. So this reinforces our commitment towards uh, um, and get delivering uh, the environmental goals while maintaining and enhancing our services. Um, the other key factor is also uh, there's various grant programs available uh, to promote electrification and use of our technology. So uh, we have listed here a few of those and um, uh, and I uh, with the advancing our environmental goals, um, aids or accelerates our, uh, puts us in a better position uh, for these uh, programs and funding opportunities. Uh, lastly, we also looked at, uh, we did a comprehensive review of the other uh, uh, transit operators in the region, uh, what the best practices are, and we derived uh, insights from that to develop the uh, draft uh, Sustainability policy. So with that, I will jump into the uh, key components of the uh, uh, policy. Um, so what we have done here is we are looking beyond environmental goals. So we have added social and governance factors to shape up the uh, sustainability policy here. Uh, speaking to um, in our leadership and environmental stewardship. Um, all of these uh, efforts that are listed here are things that we uh, continue to pursue and have always pursued. Uh, so we are formalizing those efforts in this policy. 
for example, our partnership with stakeholders to implement innovative solutions. Uh, this uh, particular component speaks specifically to zero emission mission and aligns with our uh, service mission and expansion policy. So the service mission and expansion policy sets goals and with respect to where do we want to see ourselves um, with respect to terminals, vessels, and facilities. Here we are setting a target to achieve those goals. And uh, uh, this is an ambitious goal. Uh, again, it reinforces our strong commitment towards electrification and uh, mission of achieving new emissions. Uh, so uh, the third uh, component is the it speaks to resource conservation, and uh, the first four bullet points highlighted here are again efforts that we have. Uh, always pursued um, as part of our extensive environmental review process. And um, the, the uh, new thing that we have added here is uh, taking a phased approach to achieve a zero-based uh, system. Um, uh, the fourth factor uh, we have um, included in the policy it speaks to resilience. And uh, you know, we are all very aware and have observed climate change impacts starting from water shortage to uh, uh, sea level rise. And um, what we are um, uh, what we are bringing here is uh, um, making sure that we are adequately prepared for such instances that we have an adaptive strategy in place. Um, to be uh, more greener and uh, self-sufficient. Uh, for the next piece, I will turn it over to Terrence. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, uh, Chair Wonderman and board members. Um, Terrence Kendall, Government Regulatory Affairs Specialist. Uh, the Government Regulatory Affairs Department and the Planning Department will be working very closely together um, to develop this plan, particularly on the um, six key focuses of um, social equity and environmental justice. Uh, these six uh, focus areas are to deliver cost-effective quality and safe service for all, prioritize system expansion to benefit disadvantaged communities and mitigate negative environmental impacts, uh, promote workforce uh, diversity through fair recruitment and career advancement, uh, engage in programs supporting equitable employment and industry expansion, collaborate with community organizations to address, address equity, accessibility, and environmental concerns, and to ensure inclusivity uh, with affordable fares and promote active terminal access for healthy communities. I'll briefly touch on the work we are already doing uh, with these focus areas and how this plan will guide those efforts going forward. Um, SF Bay Ferry has done a tremendous job in its efforts uh, to be inclusive in its hiring practices, coalescing extraordinary talent that is diverse in perspective and experience and working with and in working with our CPS HR consultants, those efforts will continue and improve. This plan out, will outline strategies for improving organizational health and promoting equitable and inclusive work environments for the agency. The uh, Government Regulatory Affairs Department has been working diligently in partnership with the Working Waterfront Coalition to achieve the goal of increasing available maritime labor by recruiting and training under, underserved and disadvantaged communities. Uh, additionally, under direction from the board, we've also implemented a bevy of strategies to increase capacity for increased and improved work on our uh, disadvantaged business enterprise program. Uh, as uh, staff were as recently concluded the 360 review on the DBE program uh, done by Colette Holt, the results of which will be brought to the board before the end of the calendar year. Um, the sustainability plan will include strategies for improving our DBE program in line with these focuses, as well as finding the nexus between the Working Waterfront Coalition and our efforts for increasing DBE participation on our contracts. As part of developing the outreach plan, we will work with current transit equity and environmental justice focused advocacy partners, as well as expand our outreach and network to uh, connect with groups that uh, serve and advocate 
uh, for disabled and disadvantaged communities we've yet to reach in an effort to inform them of the tremendous amount of work that SF Bay Ferry is already doing and to understand from them the ways in which we can improve that work and our services and facilities to better meet their needs. This plan will also guide uh, will also got work being done uh, with other Bay Area transit agencies through involvement in the Title VI, the working groups and collaborating on first and last mile connections, affordability and accessibility for riders between our systems. The execution of the work guided by these six key focus areas will ensure that SF Bay Ferry continues to provide the most equitable and inclusive service it possibly can and ensure that no one is left behind at the proverbial dot. And with that, I'll pass it back to Art. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, thanks, Darren. So uh, the last uh, component of the policy uh, speaks to uh, governance. So we have all these goals and objectives defined. Uh, so what we're doing with it is uh, uh, creating a plan that specifies metrics and targets to achieve the different reporting requirements and plans that we have. Uh, the prospect of achieving, for example, zero emissions. Um, so, um, uh, and the second and the other piece to this is um, we are going beyond the limit with respect to establishing partnerships with the third party entities um, to create more visibility, more transparency mechanism. And, uh, uh, um, and uh, finally, with a, with a third party also, basically. Uh, so that pretty much summarizes the key components of um, the sustainability policy. Um, as the mentioned here, we have outlined the next steps. Uh, so today we are here to um, receive the board's comments on the uh, sustainability draft policy. And uh, we'll incorporate those comments and come back uh, to you with the final version. And uh, moving forward, we would uh, uh, pending board's adoption, we should start in the outreach process with different stakeholders um, and come up with uh, a draft uh, sustainability plan that speaks to those um, action items. Um, lastly, um, as uh, uh, Terence had detailed mentioned, um, uh, these are the different stakeholders that we'll be uh, collaborating with, and this will be a collective effort between planning and government and regulatory affairs. Um, to develop the sustainability. Uh, with that, I'll wrap up the presentation and ask questions. Thank you. Great. Uh, th thank you. We appreciate the work that's gone into this the thinking and the comprehensive report. Um, and I think it's un it aren't unarguable that WIDA, the SFA Ferry, has done, you know, is doing a great deal. Uh, to become a model of sustainability uh, within our sphere. I don't think there's any uh, question about it. Um, proofs in the pudding. And the events we're doing tomorrow and all of the work on electrification and the partnerships, you know, all speak to to it and uh, and the, the staff and you, you guys are doing great work. I, I just, uh, I looked at my phone a second ago, I apologize for it, and it's 70 degrees here in San Francisco. Oh, and it's 103 degrees in Walnut Creek. Oh. So uh, we live in a region that is uh, is as differentiated, you know, in terms of its climate, like few other places. Um, and you know, the the folks who are living in Walnut Creek, you know, their their air conditioners are going full blast. You know, they're demanding energy at very high levels. And you know, I think it's they're probably using a lot more water and uh, resources because of the nature of the climate there than, than here in San Francisco and around the Bay or on Treasure Island. And so, you know, I, I think a lot of the plan as I read it and hear it is really focused on the, on the transit aspect. You know, what kind of transit can we provide and the way we do that work and what kind of organization we are but you know, I, I think we just have to keep in mind the the overall vision is a is a water is a water front um, water based lifestyle in in the region and enabling more to occur on the waterfront so that people can can live this lifestyle or work this lifestyle and be in a place 
that has a temperate climate rather than a you know an incredibly hot uh, place that requires you know that demands so much energy and so forth. So I would just um, you know the land you know what happens on the water side I think is kind of clear, but the role of our agency on the land side is really important, and it's not so much it's not so clear in the law as to what our responsibilities are. When we wrote the law, we tried that, but the legislature sort of shortchanged us on it a little bit. But we have influence. Uh, we have some leverage. We have resources. And we've got a very great professional team. So as we as we proceed, you know, I think it's it's just really important, you know, this agency and the stakeholders in the agency, um, you know, recognize the opportunity that we have to do more on the water build more on the water, to entertain more, uh, to to uh, produce a, a maritime economy. And I'm pleased that next month's meeting will cover the subject of how to, you know, the, consider rebuild, you know, creating a, a maritime uh, Bay Area region that actually creates the, the uh, vessels and equipment necessary. But uh, I think that's what the situation is calling for of us. And we, you know, we, we, aren't just enabled to operate a service based on what occurs on the land. To some degree, we we enable what occurs on the land. And you can't live, a, you know, it's not practical to have waterfront activities if you don't have waterfront transportation. And uh, so, you know, there's a, uh, there's a real important nexus there. So when it comes to working with cities, uh, planning agencies, businesses, um, advocacy groups, and so forth as we go forward. And I, I hope it could somehow be reflected in the plan. You know, it seems to me w w the number one thing we could do, it's very clear we're heading for electric vessels, and we're going to do that. We're on, the, we're on the way. We've crossed the start line. Uh, but, you know, we really should maybe double back on the land use aspect um, and see what we can achieve, you know, help achieve as a region to make sure that we are maximizing. We can't build everything. Not everyone can, you know, can be there. But the more we can do that, the, I think the better off our region is going to be, the world is going to be. And I, I think it really behooves our agency to show as much leadership as we can uh, kind of put together on that. So with that, I thank you and uh, open it up for comments from the board. Yeah, just real quick on the equity piece, I did want to share that the Working Waterfront Coalition hosted an information session at the Vallejo EDD office last month, and there it was like standing room only. There was almost 40 people in the room, and it was super exciting. Um, all ages, ethnicities, and backgrounds, it was really exciting. And um, and they already, the last time I checked in, they had 120 applicants. The first class will start in Vallejo on August 1st. And um, I also submitted the proposal for the coalition to the um, Napa Solano Sub-Regional California Jobs First Committee. Um, and they are uh, working waterfront coalition is gonna be presenting on July 24th to the PJS. So super excited about that. Just to add one thing that, um, uh, that was pointed out as I guess with the grant money that the, the coalition got, um, they can't touch anybody under the eight years of 18, 18 right. years or younger. Right. Right. It's got, we have to pass it a, a bill mm -hmm. at some point to yeah. reverse that. Yeah. That way we can get into the high schools with these programs right. too. So that might be something we Thank want to keep on our radar. Yeah. To, there, there was actually a few yeah. people that were in high school that came and were unable to oh, wow. participate. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That'd be a state state bill. It'd be a state bill, but something that you know we might want to yeah just you know find a co-sponsor or be a co-sponsor or help lobby for it. Because that, that that was one of the focuses of the uh, working water coalition was to get younger folks into the maritime. Yeah. So we'll right. Uh, yeah. Looking into that. Yes. Right. Other members of the board comments questions. Uh, yeah. I. It's a. Uh, really holistic. I, I think you've covered everything that I could ever have thought of. And so I'm looking forward to seeing the plan being developed based on these policies or components of the policy. 
Um, and I can't thank staff enough for just a, how having these goals, pushing the agency and all staff and crew and operators and stakeholders in the same direction when it comes to not only wake and sound, but also when truly climate change and equity and workforce. Um, I'm I'm so excited to see what the next years, few years have in place for, for the organization. But, and I'm again, back to the internal promotions that we've seen in the organization here as of this board meeting. It's fantastic. And having Gary join at this time and, I mean, it's just fantastic. So keep up the good work and just move move forward. Keep plugging away on all of the policy components that you're laying out here. Thank you. So I'd, I'd just like to add as well, my thanks, um, aren't the interns. Uh, it's for, for Director Alba and I, um, we've seen most of this as we went through the 2050 plan mm -hmm. and various iterations and heard the public comments and uh, added some of our own. Um, and what I like about the policy is, is as you laid out some of the under the headers, um, some of those some of those items are very tangible and very visible and be able to see and define success. But alternatively, some of them are very abstract um, and have really long lead times. And so my one request is when we come back and talk about this in September, we could have a small conversation on just maybe annually or how, how are we going to measure our progress? Because that's always, at least in my experience, a key aspect mm -hmm. right now of how organizations are charting their path to, to um, net zero, frankly. But uh, and, and on all these attributes, I, I love that it's really an ESG plan. Um, so thank you for that. But I'd uh, love to just make sure that we don't lose track of charting our success, at least at a minimum on an annual basis. Uh, one of the things that uh, uh, during our review of what other kinds of agency practices were, one of the things that we have noticed is that typically the plan defines the short-term action items. Mm. Um, like similar to how we did the fair policy, fair policy and policy and fair program. And um, and um, um, apart from the plan, there would be on a frequent basis annual or quarterly um, progress uh, that shows where we are with respect to checking the final target. So those are some of the ideas that we have captured. Awesome. Um, Good to know. Thank you. Super okay, happy I think I think we've got everyone commenting. How about from the public? Do we have any requests? Uh, Everybody has signed up. Any uh, member of this uh, group in the room or on the screen wish to make a comment? Okay. Once again, you know, thank you for. I, I think there's a lot of uh, obviously a lot of leadership thought and leadership that went into this and we're excited to see you know the next round and and both this into action so thank you yeah okay perfect that brings us to public uh, item 13 the last item which is public comments for non-agenda items uh, melanie has anyone signed up to speak on a item not appearing on the agenda nobody has signed would anyone here but oh, we have a uh, Loriana. Hi, so, I'm great. Thank you. Um, I waited till the final item because I wanted to express my thanks and excitement again about the pilot project for the Redwood City Ferry service to the Giants games. It's coming up really fast. Our first uh, event is supposed to be um, July 28th, and I just note that we don't have a link to order tickets yet online and I wondered when that might be coming online and when we can start telling people to get tickets for the ferry so if if I could have a little bit more um, details about that I'd really appreciate it or if it's really really close but still in the works 
Um, could I have an idea of when that might be happening? Thank you. Excellent. Yeah, so um, thanks for the question, Maria. Um, yeah, so tickets should be available um, in the coming in the coming week. We're still finalizing um, the uh, the service plan and exactly what that's going to look like. Um, but uh, we should have a link and tickets available um, within the, within the uh, start of uh, or mid next week. Um, we're also telling people if you are interested in, in getting tickets to sign up for the Giants link, and that link is on our website. Um, so you'll be the first to know um, when the tickets do come on sale. Okay. Uh, yeah, I, I just it's it takes a little bit of um, scrolling around to find that little link to sign up for the uh, for the email notification, the blast, e blast. So um, maybe we can make that a little more prominent somehow because um, you have to kind of click on a few pages before you get there. Um, just a thought. We want it to be successful. So thanks. Absolutely. When I, when I read about it in the uh, in the report in the material, I you know go at, through it quickly and I saw that it was one of three pilots for FY 2025, and so I didn't do the math and I thought, well, that's interesting. Next year we're going to be going to the Giants game from Redwood City with plenty of time to plan for it, not realizing <laughs> that we're in FY 2025. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, government operates in strange ways, so you know, it's just, you know, we really need, need to get on top of this. I did, I didn't realize we did, but we do. So thank you for. Uh, I think everyone but me realized it. So thank you, uh, Laurian. And I think it is really exciting, and we should make it uh, very, very successful. So uh, you know, someone asked me about it today about Redwood City. And I said, yeah, we're going to do a pilot in 2025. So, <laughs> yeah, in two and a half weeks. <laughs> they don't live in Redwood City. They live in Portland, so it doesn't matter. They wouldn't have gone anyway. But it's important for me to understand and communicate okay. better. Yeah. Go ahead. People who do live in Redwood City. Yeah, um, Commissioner, uh, Commissioner uh, Castro, this is Jessica. Yeah. Thank you so much for including the link directly to the sign up page on in the Redwood City or the port. Uh, newsletter that went out earlier this week. That was how I found out about it as well and the dates, et cetera. So um, you, your organization is where I often find <laughs> this information. So I appreciate that. Um, we, we need to blast it all over town since it's coming up in just a few weeks. We just want the tickets to be available. Right. Yeah, and, and for you. people to sign up in advance. So I appreciate it. Thank you. Yes, thank, thank you. you. Any other members of the public wish to uh, make comment on non-agendized items? Okay, th thank you all. Hearing none, I will adjourn the meeting. And Chair, one minute before yeah, you right. do, I just uh, neglected at the start of the meeting when we were uh, reporting on some of the changes in roles and responsibilities. Uh, we have another one that was uh, really important as we've implemented the, the reorg. Um, one of the key points that APTA made in their report was we need to have strong project controls. Uh, and Joe Ramey uh, is, was selected to be our project development and controls lead. Uh, so uh, he's uh, filling that role. He wasn't here in the room, so I missed him, but he's uh, here on the screen and reported. So congrats, Joe. Yeah. Okay. Um, any other non-agenda items? <laughs> okay, see you in August, folks, and have a great summer.